for in one hour is thy judgment come. Babylon falls quickly. Things can change very, very rapidly. See, if I end up running from the Lamb when He reappears, something has gone terribly wrong in my life. The Messiah not only has to fulfill all those Old Testament prophecies, not only does He have to die in the exact year that Daniel chapter 9 says, but He also has to accept the guilt of every human sin right before He dies and then die within that 24-hour period. I will pay the penalty and I will die that same day. God never forces the mind. So first Jesus prayed that those who follow him would be separated from the world based on what this book says right here. So God has his sign and the devil has his mark or his sign of authority. And it's up to us to decide which way we will go. As we gather here, we are delighted that Dr. Tim Rumsey has agreed to come and be with us for this month as he presents these Bible messages each of the evenings that we meet. He is from Missouri and has chosen to come here to Colorado at our invitation, and we are just delighted to have him here. And we, we have a fairly simple format, and so without any further, um, <clears throat> any further uh, discussion, I would like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we invite God's presence to be here this evening. Our gracious Father in heaven, what a joy it is to meet with others who believe in you, who understand your love for us. And we ask in a very special way that as Dr. Rumsey presents to us your word, that your spirit will speak to each of our hearts and that we may understand more of your love for us and your will for our lives each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. It's good to be here with you, and thank you for coming tonight. Really looking forward to this series of meetings. And as uh, we just mentioned, these will be going on for four weeks, five nights a week, every night except Monday nights and Thursday nights. And um, for whatever reason you have come, in fact, I'd like to ask uh, how many of you came because of a postcard that you received in the mail? If you can just raise your hand because of that. Okay. And uh, how many of you came because of an ad that you saw in the newspaper? And uh, how many just by word of mouth, a personal invitation? And that's often why we come. Amen. Wonderful. Well, just a couple of additional announcements here. In the pew back in front of you, you should see a couple of cards like this. And on the back, it just says questions and comments. And so if um, you have a question or something that you would like to know more about, and that comes to your mind as you're listening this evening, please just write that down at the end of the presentation. Uh, we will have a short question and answer period, and we'll do our best to get through these questions and to give you a good biblical answer for that. Also, uh, we're all wired a little bit differently. Some people like to take notes. And so if you're the kind of person that likes to take notes, I'll do my best not to talk too fast for you. But if you prefer to just sit and listen, um, don't worry we will give you a study guide when you leave. Everyone will get a study guide uh, on tonight's topic, and we'll have one of these each night as well. So as you leave tonight, please make sure that the kind folks at the doors uh, give one of these to you, and then you can have a good summary of all the things that we've looked at tonight. This series is called Revelation Unfolding. We will be studying the book of Revelation, but not only the book of Revelation. We'll be looking at... Um, many of the lines of prophecy that we find in the Bible, and truly all of the Bible is a revelation from God. That's the claim that the Bible makes, 
And we'll be looking at many of those claims as we work our way through these prophecies from night to night. The uh, title for our study tonight is Chaos, Earth's Approaching Crisis. And um, as you can probably guess, I did not have to look very hard to find recent news articles that had the word chaos in them. It seems like wherever we look and whatever facet of society right now, things are in turmoil. Here's just a few examples of recent headlines that I, I found. Uh, going back just a couple years here, U.S. military chiefs in quarantine as COVID chaos spreads and Trump recuperates. And uh, I think everybody here is well aware of that chaos that uh, our world has been through the last few years because of the COVID pandemic. And if you remember in the middle of 2020, uh, a string of violent riots erupted here in the United States, and it wasn't limited just to this continent. So these riots made their way to Europe and other places as well. So there was absolute chaos in Minneapolis as protests grow across the U.S. Um, I liked this tile, title, a cacophony of chaos. Why the U.S. election outcome is more uncertain than ever. And this, of course, referring back a couple of years to our last presidential election. And we can't forget the climate chaos as well. So yet another headline, climate chaos, extreme heat, wildfires, and record-setting storms suggest a frightening future is already here. U.S. political chaos continues into January 6th Capitol riots anniversary. And uh, again, it seems wherever we look in whatever aspect of society, we are just finding this theme of chaos, chaos, chaos. Big impact, UK economic chaos, pound plunge hits businesses. So the economy, of course, uh, is in some pretty deep trouble right now. And this is a global problem as uh, we face a recession and so forth. Political chaos, economic collapse, and terror threat. Pakistan battling a perfect storm of crises. And truly, that is what we are seeing, right? It's not just one problem here or one problem there. It's many problems compounding and, and combining together. Peru's political chaos looks likely to persist. Again, we're seeing this all over the world in different places. And some of you may have heard just recently of the economic problems over in Nigeria as they are introducing a new currency, um, a digital currency, and there's just not enough cash uh, to go around as they're working their way through this transition. So Nigeria's Naira shortage, anger and chaos outside of banks. We've got similar problems in South Africa. It's descending, its parliament is descending into chaos as well. Iran's government scrambles to contain its financial chaos. And our last one here, children caught up in chaos as Russia invades Ukraine. We could keep going, of course, but uh, we don't need to. Our purpose here is to open the Bible and to find out what the Bible is saying to us about Earth's situation today. So if you have a Bible, if you brought your Bible, please take it. And let's open together as we look at what the Bible is telling us about our world and where we are headed. Our first question, what great crisis lies ahead in Earth's future? And you may be thinking, Earth's future, aren't we there right now? It seems like a great crisis right now. And yes, things are troublesome, but the Bible says that things will get worse before they get better. So Daniel 12 verse 1 says this, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now there's a few things that we need to notice about this verse. First of all, this great time of trouble such as never was, the Bible says, earth is headed toward more problems before things get better. And yes, that's bad news, but the good news is that God has promised things will get better. He will solve all the problems on earth. That's one of the basic messages that the Bible gives to us. But between here tonight <laughs> and when God does finally put an end to the chaos, things get a little bit dicey. And we'll be looking at a lot of those prophecies that reveal 
what will happen as we continue studying. Michael stands up, and um, Michael is another name for Jesus in the Bible. And uh, here we see Jesus standing up, and he is the one that delivers his people at the end of time. And there's good news here, right? The promise is that we can be delivered, you can be delivered from this chaos and from this trouble that is wrapping around earth. We need to have our names written in the book. And that book is a reference to the book of life. And uh, we'll look at that more closely in some future nights. But when you claim Jesus as your Savior, your name is written in that book of life. Next question. How will life change when this final crisis hits? Now we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 18. And Revelation, of course, is the last book in your Bible. And we'll find chapter number 18. And here's what the Bible says. John writes, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now Babylon is one of the great sim symbols that we find in the book of Re Revelation. Revelation is written in symbols. In fact, the very first book in the, in, or the very first verse in the book of Revelation explains that this book of the Bible is uh, revealed in symbols. Here's the first verse of chapter one. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And that word in the King James signified simply means it's, it's placed in symbols. And so we find things like beasts and we find uh, angels, although angels are real, they also can represent God's people uh, or messages that the church is giving to the world. You find water, you find all these different kinds of symbols. There are horns and, and crowns and things like this. And one of the challenges, but also the fun things about studying the book of Revelation especially, is that uh, we can decode these symbols by uh, allowing the Bible to explain itself. As we compare verse with verse and passage with passage, we find that these symbols are explained and revealed. So we don't have to guess. We're not stabbing in the dark. The Bible helps us understand. All of that to say, in Revelation 18, verse 2, when we read about Babylon the Great, whatever that is, the Bible helps us understand what Babylon is. In the book of Revelation, Babylon is, is an end time uh, coalition or alliance of humanity. And uh, it ends up fighting against God. Uh, now we'll read a couple of these verses in just a moment. But even in verse 2, we see that Babylon is full, filled with devils and the, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So according to the Bible, Babylon is not a place that you would want to live, right? Right. It's, uh, at least spiritually, a very dangerous place to be. Now, earlier in the Bible, in fact, all the way in the first book of the Bible, in Genesis, we find uh, a human enterprise that is now known as the Tower of Babel. And these, this tower was built by some of Noah's descendants that decided to rebel against God. They didn't believe God's promise that he would never again send another flood. And so they start building this very tall tower, and they try to reach to heaven itself. And their idea is not only to escape another possible flood, but they are trying to rebuild a, or build a world empire with Babel as its head. They want to be rulers of the world. Uh, to summarize the story, God comes down, he stops their building project by confusing their languages, and uh, the Tower of Babel uh, never gets completed. But that symbol representing like one world government, uh, humanity fighting against God, that symbol is picked up from the book of Genesis. And now we find it in the book of Revelation. And instead of being a local tower somewhere, say, in the Middle East, now Babylon in Revelation represents a worldwide human project that is in rebellion against God. Let's keep reading here. This is now verse number three. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, 
and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. In this verse, we can find at least three um, parts of Babylon. There is the spiritual or religious part, which was mentioned in the verse before with demons and the spirits of devils. But we also see political elements, right? The kings of the earth uh, are involved in this and also the economy, the economic powers of this earth. So uh, religion, politics, economics, they're all being wrapped together here under the umbrella of Babylon. Jumping ahead to verse 8. Therefore shall her or Babylon's plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. The Bible predicts that this Babylon experiment, uh, experiment or this Babylon enterprise will come to its end as it tries to fight against God. And there will be great chaos, a time of trouble such as never was as Babylon falls. Now, I hope you have your Bible, because we're going to look at a few specific verses now in verse number 18, and we'll see just a few of the things that descend into chaos as Babylon falls. We already mentioned politics. If we look at verses 9 and 10, we see reference again to the kings of the earth. So Revelation 18, verse 9, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Verse 10, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Babylon falls quickly. This chaos descends upon earth's inhabitants quickly. That's one of the messages. In verse 11, we see the economy mentioned again. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. Verse 12 mentions the luxury items, so the standard of living will drop drastically. Look at verse 12. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all thine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble, and it just keeps going and going, doesn't it? The standard of living will drop. Look at verse 13. We see here reference to the food supply. Cinnamon, odors, ointments, frankincense, wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat. All of these things, too, are affected, and the food supply descends into chaos. This is a permanent collapse. Verse 14 tells us this, The fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and they shall find them no more at all. So we're looking here at a picture of earth in its final moments, and it truly does descend into chaos, even the entertainment industry. Look at verse 22. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And I play trumpet, so that's a hard verse to read. But the Bible says that uh, even these things, you know, that make life enjoyable, the entertainment that that. Uh, wraps the intention of so many people, this too disappears eventually as Babylon collapses. So what happens immediately after Babylon falls? Well, that's Revelation 18 that we just looked at. If we look at Revelation chapter 19, we see reference to what happens right after that. And this is the return of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open to behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So this is how the chaos climaxes and then ends here on earth. Jesus Christ returns at the second coming. Which leads us to our next question. What signs will indicate that Christ's return is near. Turn to Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to spend uh, most of the rest of our night here, our study tonight, in Matthew chapter 24. This is the chapter where Jesus describes the signs leading up to his second coming. And he is talking to his disciples in this chapter, and we'll just dive in right here with verse number 6. Jesus says, You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. That means in many places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Okay, so Jesus goes through uh, a number of signs here. We could categorize them or group them into some basic categories. There are signs in nature and the environment. And we'll take a look at some of those tonight. Jesus also mentions wars and rumors of wars. This would be political in nature. And uh, we will look at the political situation on earth, not tonight, but in some future nights. Jesus also mentions religion and uh, deception. So we'll have to deal with that as well in future nights. And um, we'll also briefly look at signs in the economy, which Jesus mentions in the Gospel of Luke as well. And then society and culture. So again, every facet of human life uh, is probably represented in one of these basic categories. So here we go. Famine. Jesus mentions famine. And uh, current statistics tell us that there are 9.1 million deaths because of uh, famine or malnutrition each year. And that, uh, if you do the math, that's 25,000 people dying per day or 17 people dying every single minute. And that gets really sobering, doesn't it? Because we've been going now almost 30 minutes, about 25 minutes, and you can do the math. 17 people for each of those minutes uh, worldwide. Very, very serious problem here on Earth. 70 to 100 million people died from famine in the 20th century. Uh, in 2017, the United Nations declared that famine had officially returned to the continent of Africa. And uh, currently, there are about 20 million people at risk of death from famine just in the countries of Nigeria, South Sudan, Yemen, and Somalia. So we definitely see, yes, famine is a big issue right now. It's part of the chaos on this earth. Jesus also mentions pestilence or disease. So we are told major disease outbreaks have increased from around 800 between the years 1980 to 1985 to nearly 3,200 between the years 2005 and 2009. That is a very drastic increase, isn't it, in the number of new disease outbreaks that are occurring within uh, just a four or five year period here. We can go back to about the year 2000 and just remind ourselves of some of the uh, outbreaks that have happened here. We had the uh, West Nile virus in 2000, anthrax, remember all those scares with the white powder that was going through the mail and so forth? Uh, that was 2001. We had uh, SARS, uh, another SARS virus in 2003. There was an outbreak of mumps in 2006, E. coli and salmonella in 2006, the H1N1 or swine flu virus in 2009, Whooping cough made a return in 2012. Uh, Ebola, a really scary one, right? 2014, Ebola was raising its ugly head. Uh, the Zika virus in 2016. And of course, in the last few years, we have been dealing with COVID-19. And that's just the short list, right? There are others as well. So yes, pestilence is a big, and it seems like a growing problem in our world today. Now, this one was interesting. Uh, disease cases from fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. And I know these numbers are a little small on your screen, but on the left-hand side, that first year is 2004 with around 25,000 reported cases. And you can see the increase up to the last year on this chart, which is 2016, and it has skyrocketed up to almost 100,000 reported cases. That's uh, in the United States. And I will testify if my backyard is any indication, yes, the ticks and uh, other little nasties are increasing. Uh, we've got a place in the country, and uh, boy, when the warm weather hits, the ticks are coming out, uh, and it makes it very difficult to enjoy walking through the woods out there. So we see this increasing as well. Another sign in the uh, natural environment are the mass animal deaths, which are occurring every year. Uh, hundreds of these events reported every year all around the world. So National Geographic says huge animal die-offs along with disease outbreaks and other population stressors are happening more often. Just a few examples. On the left-hand side here, there was a story of hundreds of elephants that died in a mysterious mass die-off. They 
don't know what killed all these elephants. They just found them all dead. Um, 380 whales died in Australia's worst stranding in history. A, a stranding is when you know, a whale runs itself up on the beach. It can't get back to the water, and so they die there. And uh, kind of a, a dark picture there, but you can see the whales on the beach. Uh, this one was particularly widespread in its scope. Um, the Moscow Times reported just a couple years ago, 95% of marine life on the seafloor killed in the Kamchatka eco disaster. And this is a very large peninsula, you can see on the map, that stretches down from Siberia. And 90% of the marine life they just found dead. And they eventually determined it was probably due to some kind of pollution that had killed uh, millions or even billions of these sea creatures. Jesus also mentions earthquakes, so let's take a moment and look at earthquakes. These, this is a list here, or a graph of the major earthquakes since 1920, and this is taken directly from the United States Geological Survey website. So in the 1920s, there were about 35 of these, and you can see in each decade, almost every decade, there's an increase. Until the 2010s, we had 140 of these major earthquakes. Here's another way to look at it. These are earthquakes uh, with a magnitude of 8.5 or greater. And what you're looking at now in each column is centuries. So that first column with a very short yellow line uh, represents the 1500s. And there were one or two of these great earthquakes. Now, by the way, people will say, but they didn't have seismometers back in the 1500s. And you would be correct, they didn't. But it's also true that you do not need a piece of scientific equipment to tell you that you are in the middle of an 8.5 magnitude earthquake. This is when buildings are falling over, there are tidal waves being produced, things like this. And so obviously in any century, people have been able to record when earthquakes of this magnitude strike. So you can see the increase in the 1600s, there were uh, maybe three or four of these earthquakes. In the 1700s, it jumped all the way up to about nine. That held steady through the 1800s and the 1900s. And then look what happened in the 20th century. Uh, I'm sorry, in the 21st century. The dark yellow on the bottom are the recorded earthquakes so far in the first 20 years of this century. If we extrapolate that and multiply it by five to reach 100 years in the century, you can see what that will mean and we will have hit uh, at least 30 of these mega earthquakes. So this prediction that earthquakes will be increasing as we approach Christ's second coming certainly seems to be falling in line also with the other things we're looking at. Now the cost of these natural disasters is also increasing over time. So here are the number of billion dollar disasters in the United States, and this is adjusted for inflation. So we're tracking from the 1980s on the left all the way up through the 2010s. You can see the dramatic increase from about $30 billion up to $120 billion. Uh, these disasters are not only getting more frequent, but they're getting more severe and intense as well. Uh, another way of looking at that, the cost of these disasters um, just going up exponentially over time. All right, let's change gears just a bit. And uh, we'll look at something else Jesus says in Luke 21, verse 25. This is another sign of his return. Jesus says, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. And the Greek word there that is translated as perplexity in English literally means to be without resources or to be in straits. So we're looking here at economic issues, economic problems and troubles. And uh, I don't need to tell you tonight that the world is facing very serious economic problems right now. And um, you don't even need to read the headlines, right? We can feel it in our own pocketbooks. Uh, things are getting very difficult economically. Unlike 2008, our current economic crisis is underpinned by multiple debt bubbles. If you remember back in 2008, that recession was caused by the collapse of the housing market, you know, just one sector of the economy. Here we are told there are many sectors of the economy that are in trouble. So this is potentially a much more serious economic uh, crisis that we face than back in 2008. When we add these um, 
bubbles together, it becomes clear that long before the coronavirus made its debut in China, an economic crisis of historic proportions was in the works. Okay, so this is a global problem. Uh, our world is very interconnected now, even more so than it was in 2008. And uh, we are seeing the results of that in the economic crisis that we're facing. Another headline here um, from S&P Global, the global debt leverage is a great reset coming. And this article stated, global debt has hit a record $300 trillion. That is 349% leverage on gross domestic product. So globally, the world is in debt about three and a half times more than what we are producing. Now that's a problem, isn't it? Does that kind of math work for your household? <laughs> no, and it doesn't work for my household either. And it's not going to work for the global economy for very long. This translates to $37,500 of average debt for each person in the world versus GDP per capita of just $12,000. So if you feel like you're in debt, well, you are, uh, at least $37,500. Okay, another question. What will society's condition be at the end of time? And here's what the Bible tells us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's quite a list, isn't it? And the Apostle Paul who wrote this uh, really isn't um, pulling back any punches, right? He is explaining this is what society is going to look like as uh, the world approaches its final crisis. And I'll leave it up to you if that's an accurate reflection of society, but uh, it certainly seems like it to me. Now, we could say, yes, that's the world at large, right? But look what Paul says next, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. The shocking thing is that Paul is not so much describing the world out there as he is describing those that profess to be Christians. And this should be a very sobering wake-up call to all, who, all of us who profess to be Christians, right? How, what kind of lives are we living? And uh, we want to have the real power of God in our lives and not turn away from that. Speaking of, take your Bible and let's look at just a couple of verses that I will not have on the screen here because we want to have, we need to have the power of God in our lives. So just two quick verses that will help us understand what it means to have the power of God in our lives and to keep us from living a life that uh, is explained in the verses just before this. So let's turn verse to Romans chapter 1. This is uh, in the New Testament, shortly after the Gospels. Romans chapter 1. And we will be looking here at... Very important passage that describes what the power of God is in our lives. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Paul writing also here, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the gospel, the good news of salvation that the Bible explains that comes through Jesus Christ, this brings power into our lives when we accept the good news of that gospel, when we accept Jesus as our Savior. God promises that He will then uh, fill our lives with His power and help us to live the life that He wants to live, he, that He wants us to live, uh, rather than that list that we saw just a moment ago. Verse 17 goes on, For therein, or through the power of God, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so God promises to help us live by faith in His Word and in His power as well. One last verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And here's another verse that explains what the power of God is. 
Jesus speaking to his disciples just before he goes back to heaven. And he says, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now we're going to study the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're going to spend a whole night looking at what the Bible says about this most important gift from God, the Holy Spirit. But the promise for tonight is that God wants to give you his power in your life. And that power comes through faith in Jesus Christ, accepting Jesus as your Savior, and God filling you with his Holy Spirit so that you have his divine power at work in your life. Let's look at one more sign. What is the sign that will immediately precede Christ's return? Jesus says this in Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So, do we see the gospel being preached to all the world? It's in many places. There are some places of the world that are not very open to the gospel. And it would be interesting to ask the question, in those parts of the world that are not open to Christianity at least not openly open to Christianity, do we see the gospel growing? Do we see uh, even an underground church movement? And the answer is yes. So there was this fascinating story on Fox News a few years ago. Iran has the world's fastest growing church, despite no buildings, and it's mostly led by women. And so these gentlemen here were explaining this on Fox News. And the story goes on. According to a new survey of 50,000 Iranians, 1.5% identified as Christian. Extrapolating over Iran's population of approximately 50 million literate adults, the sample surveyed yields at least 750,000 believers. Now, granted, that's not a large percentage of the population, but given the, uh, the situation over there, and uh, how dangerous it can be to be a Christian, this is a pretty remarkable growth of Christianity. We could also look at another country, China, which, of course, also is not very open to Christianity. Protestant Christianity is booming in China, and you can see the chart on the bottom there representing the growth over the last several decades. Uh, another article says it this way. There are more practicing Catholics in China than in Italy and more practicing Protestants than in all of Europe. If this growth continues at the current rate, in less than two decades, China will become the largest Christian country in the world. By 2030, it is very likely that there will be more Protestants in China than all Christians combined in the United States. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Largest country in the world, and the gospel is taking root people are accepting this good news. And Jesus said, this would be the last sign when we see this happening and the gospel going and spreading, even in the most challenging parts of the world, we can know that Jesus is about to come back. Jesus said in John 14, verse 29, now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. So friends, I hope that tonight, uh, as we have looked at what the Bible says will happen as we approach Christ's return, you can have confidence that uh, God knew it beforehand. He recorded it in the Bible. And even though our world seems to be plunging into chaos, and the Bible says it will be, we can have the promise that God is in control. God promises to give you his power in your life. And no matter what is happening out there, he can give you his peace so that uh, you can be faithful to him. We're going to have uh, a special music here. And after that, we will bring up the cards uh, with questions on them. And we'll have a short question and answer period. Where does the Bible reference Michael as Jesus? Yes, I made that comment right at the beginning tonight, in the very first verse we looked at, there are um, several places where we see Michael mentioned. Um, Michael is always mentioned when there is a battle going on supernaturally and where God is fighting for his people or this Michael figure is fighting for his people. And um, so this is one of the clues that um, Michael represents or points to Jesus. Um, but, uh, you know, the question still is, how do we know it's not an angel? 
So uh, one place we can look at is the book of Jude, which is right before the book of Revelation. And there's only one chapter in Jude, so it's easy to reference the verses. This is simply Jude chapter, or verse 9. And here we read, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. And he durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So Michael is also the archangel, and he is contending with the devil about the body of Moses. Now we know from other places in the Bible, in Mark chapter 9, that Moses, when he died, was resurrected after his death and taken to heaven. And um, he appears with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And here we get a behind-the-scenes glimpse at an argument that is taking place between the devil and this Michael uh, personality. And Michael, apparently, is the one who raises Moses to life because he is here to resurrect the body of Moses. So this is a huge clue that Michael is none other than a divine being, the Son of God, who has the power to give life. Um, we also find in several passages that it's the voice of the archangel at the second coming. When Jesus comes back in the clouds of glory, he calls out with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise. So there's several verses here that seem to pretty clearly point to the fact that Michael is simply another name for Jesus, and especially a name when Jesus is fighting for the salvation of his people. Thank you. Next question. Bad things have always happened. Even the Bible talks about bad things. Mm -hmm. it, is it reasonable to claim that today's current events are actually fulfillments of prophecy? Yeah, that's a really good question, because obviously, uh, as long as we've had recorded history, there have been atrocities and wars and natural disasters and things like this. There is an important clue that we find in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 8. And Jesus is speaking again here. And after going through this list of signs that we dealt with tonight, he says in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And in English, it doesn't bring it out so much. But in Greek, the word that's translated as sorrows literally means birth pains the contractions that a woman will go through as she's about to deliver a baby. And uh, as any woman who has had a baby will tell you, those contractions start light and they're further apart. But as you approach the moment of delivery, those contractions get closer together, they're more frequent, and they also get more intense and more painful until the moment of delivery. And so Jesus uses this metaphor to explain, yes, there's always been bad things, that have happened on earth, and there always will be until sin is done away with. But as we approach the moment of deliverance, when Jesus comes back, these signs will continue to increase in frequency and in, uh, in strength as well. well. You would certainly think that's happening today, wouldn't you? Yes. <laughs> and you had some evidence of that on the screen, too. Yeah. How can anyone find any hope and peace except in Jesus and his promises found in the word. Well, I, that's a good statement. I, uh, more of a statement than a question, and I would agree with that as well. You know, the Bible's Jesus says um, in the Gospel of Matthew, he promises to give his peace to those who uh, entrust their lives to him. And as we look at all of these well, we have pillars up here, right? <laughs> All these pillars of society and, and culture, and they seem to be crumbling and falling apart as this chaos increases. Uh, and things that we have entrusted, or institutions even, that we have trusted, uh, all of a sudden people are starting to wonder, what can we trust? Well, there's really only one thing. It's the Word of God, and it's Jesus himself. And so I would agree with that statement. It's, it's, a, it's a good I statement. I would too. <laughs> Without... Without God's word and the promises and the knowledge of Jesus and his love, I'd be a man most miserable looking at what's happening in the world today. That's right. All right. Um, why do all these bad things need to happen before Jesus comes back? Why can't he just come? Wouldn't that be nice, right? 
walk outside tonight, and there he is, and it's all over. Um, <clears throat> the Bible explains a lot about this great fight between good and evil. It doesn't explain everything. And there are many experiences that we go through in our lives where we ask the question, why, right? Why do these bad things happen even to good people, to those that haven't deserved to lose their home or their, their loved one or whatever it may be, you know, lose their health? Um, and not all of those questions are always answered in the Bible, but we are given the promise that God does have the answers and that he will eventually make things right. Um, so we can have this confidence that the Bible gives to us that God is ultimately in control. Now we can look at it from another perspective as well. And that is that God promises in the Bible that after he has dealt with sin and sin is done away with, that sin will never rise again. And that's a wonderful promise. Mm -hmm. But we also are told that God will never take away the freedom of choice from those that are redeemed and live with him forever. How can God promise that sin will never rise again if he still gives people freedom of choice for eternity? There's really only one way that that can happen, and that is that God allows this horrible experiment of sin to run its course until it is crystal clear, not just to the angels, um, but to us as well as human beings, that anything other than what God says <laughs> is going to end in disaster. And uh, it's a painful process getting there, but uh, that's one of the reasons God is allowing this to play itself out. There are a lot of people who are tired of all the problems in this world. Me included. <laughs> <laughs> and me too. This question says, does the Bible say when Jesus will return? Mm. <laughs> there have been, you know, more than one person through history that have claimed to have figured out uh, exactly when Jesus will come back or exactly when the world will end. And uh, so far they've all been wrong, right? Because we're still here tonight. But here's what Jesus says. And this is Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. And Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And he's talking about his second coming. So very clearly, Jesus says, We cannot know the exact day or the hour when he'll come back. But that doesn't mean that we can't recognize when his return is very near. Just a few verses before Jesus makes this statement, he says this, and I'm looking now at Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise you, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. So we can know when it's, when it's close and uh, when Jesus is about to come back, even if we can't know exactly when. And what we see going around us, this chaos that you talked about this evening, certainly would be an indication, at least to me, that we are close, that he is indeed at the door. That's what the Bible seems and to indicate. And we'll learn more about that in succeeding meetings. That's right. right. You need to keep coming back every night, right? Um, as, as we continue looking at different lines of evidence, not only that the Bible is true, but that prophecy is unfolding. All right, the last question for this evening. How does a person decode the symbols in the book of Revelation? Where do you find the answers to that? <laughs> There's no index in the back that says a whole list of all of the uh, symbols. But uh, as you read the book of Revelation, and really as you read the Bible as a whole, you start to see these symbols coming out. Uh, we spoke briefly about Babel and Babylon tonight. So that's one example where you're looking at the first book of the Bible in Genesis, where it's the Tower of Babel, and then in the last book of the Bible in Revelation, where now it's Babylon, a, a, a global phenomenon. Um, I'll give you one other example. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17. One of the symbols that we find both in Daniel and Revelation is water. And we'll deal with that in future nights, but there are beasts that come up out of the water, and, and these all represent things. So what does the water represent? Well, Revelation 17, verse 15 says this. 
And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So that's pretty clear, right? Water represents masses of people. And uh, we'll have to deal with the beasts that come out of the water on a future night. But we at least know part of the equation there. And I think each evening you're going to be unfolding, decoding, if you will, a little bit of what the Bible has to say about these end time and Bible prophecies. That's right. Is that right? That's right. So what are we going to do the next couple of nights? Okay, good question. Tomorrow night, our topic is um, order what the universe reveals about God. And we'll be looking at some um, lines of in, uh, evidence in nature and uh, in the universe at large that uh, can give us confidence that the Bible's record of creation is true. And then um, Sunday night, we will come back, and our topic is conflict, Earth's final empire. And we'll kind of pick up on this theme of wars and rumors of wars, and we'll look at what the Bible reveals about the progress of warfare here on Earth, and where does it end, and how does it end. And uh, there's a lot of good news in this message here, so... All right, thank you so much for coming tonight. Let's end with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible and for the things you reveal in your word. As we look at the signs that are happening around us in this world, we see the chaos, and we are so thankful for the promises in the Bible that you are ultimately in control and that you will put an end to this chaos and uh, that you promise to give us your peace even now as we live in this world of chaos. Keep us safe. Bring us back tomorrow, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible describes the world that God created as very good, perfect in every way. The planet's ideal and even climate, harmoniously interactive ecosystems, and a pure environment sustained and nourished an astonishing array of plant and animal life. Obviously, that world was very different from ours. No famine, no fire, no floods, no earthquakes, and no deadly viruses. God's rest on the seventh day of that creation week was really a celebration of a perfectly balanced world, a planet in complete harmony with itself. That sounds nice, doesn't it? And it highlights a question that many people are asking today. Since the ancient Sabbath marked the appearance of a planet in complete harmony with itself and its creator, perhaps a contemporary Sabbath rest could signal the re-emergence of that kind of world, or at least one that is better than what we see today. The idea actually echoes many biblical concepts associated with Sabbath rest. Throughout history, farmers have recognized the importance of crop rotation and of intermittently allowing land to lie fallow. The principle is simple. Different crops demand different nutrients from the soil, and by rotating them, the land can have a chance to replenish those nutrients. When land lies fallow, the soil experiences a complete rest. Nutrients are more easily restored, the life cycles of pest organisms are disturbed, and earthworms and other beneficial animals can multiply more quickly. Probably the earliest recorded advice to let land lie fallow is found in the Bible, and it's in connection with the Sabbath cycle of seven. Just before the nation of Israel entered into the land of Canaan, God instructed Moses, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Today we recognize this as sound agricultural advice, but the ancient Israelites apparently did not follow these instructions. The Bible states that centuries later, after the nation of Babylon attacked and conquered Jerusalem, the land lay fallow until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Apparently, Israel's mistreatment of the environment 
which could have been safeguarded through observance of the Sabbath rest principle, was one significant reason that God allowed its culture and civilization to be ravaged by Babylon. Revelation, the last book in the Bible, projects some of these same issues into modern day life. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, the Bible says, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. More than one war in modern times has been fought over natural resources and food production, and it is also no secret that the same technologies that have allowed for tremendous increases in crop yields have, in many instances, also exacted terrible collateral damage on the environment and on humanity. Perhaps the Bible's Sabbath rest on the seventh day of each week and the principles of wisely using and safeguarding the resources found in our environment really could make a difference for us today.